beautifully given in the spirit of Jesus Christ. That helps my helps my spirit this day. I thank God for all that was accomplished. Aren't you glad for the wonderful words that were spoken on the cross? Difficult at the time, no doubt, but when Jesus uttered, it is finished. Thank God that our redemption was completed. We thank God for that. This morning, I trust you found your way to the book of Haggai. If you go to the, go to the New Testament and work your way back about three books, you'll find yourself there. This is a, a short book in the Bible. It packs a powerful message. It's an opportunity for God's people to do what God's given them to do, to repent, to return, to act on the revival that God sends. Revival is meaningless without us making a change in our behavior. Let me say it again to you. I want you to think about it. If you want to write it down, that's fine with me. Revival is meaningless without a change in our behavior. Now, I do not preach a work salvation. For by grace are you saved through faith. And that not of yourself is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. There is no good work that you or I could do in order to earn eternal life from our God. Our, our goodness pales in comparison to the righteousness and holiness of Almighty God. No doubt about that. We, we're not in the same league. We don't play the, play the same game. We can't get there. It's only by God's grace that we can be saved. But truly, as believers, we've been predestinated unto good works. We've been created unto good works in Christ Jesus. And God has placed a call on each one of our lives to serve him. And to live for him in this day and age, to make his gospel known, to make his message known that other people would come to Christ. And you and I, at times, drift away as believers. Amen. We do. That's a, maybe that's a, part, that's a place for an oh me instead of an amen. But we're all, we're all in that crowd. We surely are. The preacher, right on down, wherever. I don't know if right on down is the right way to express it, but all of us are in that group together. We're right in that same group together. And we thank God the Lord can stir us up, can call us back. But that means something's going to be different. If something's not different, nothing ever happened. If something's not different, nothing ever happened. And God help us by his grace to be different for God's glory and not our own. Haggai, I've waited as long as I can. I have to start reading now. I hope you're there. In the second year of Darius the king, in the sixth month, this is the first verse, obviously, of uh, Haggai 1. In the second year of Darius the king, in the sixth month, in the first day of the month, came the word of the Lord, by Haggai the prophet unto Zerubbabel the son of Shealtiel, governor of Judah, and to Joshua the son of Josedek, the high priest, saying, Thus speaketh the Lord of hosts, saying, The people, this people say, The time is not come, the time that the Lord's house should be built. Then came the word of the Lord by Haggai the prophet, saying, Is it time for you, O ye, to dwell in your sealed houses, and this house lie waste? Now therefore, thus saith the Lord of hosts, Consider your ways. Ye have sown much, and bring in little. Ye eat, but ye have not enough. Ye drink, but ye are not filled with drink. We, ye clothe you, but there is none warm. And he that earneth wages, earneth wages to put it into a bag with holes. Thus saith the Lord of hosts, consider your ways. Go up to the mountain, and bring wood, and build the house, and I will take pleasure in it, and I will be glorified, saith the Lord. Ye looked for much, and lo, it came to little. And when ye brought it home, I did blow upon it. Why? saith the Lord of hosts, because of mine house that is waste, and ye run every man unto his own house. Therefore the heaven over you is stayed from dew, and the earth is stayed from her fruit. And I called for a drought upon the land, and upon the mountains, and upon the corn, and upon the new wine, and upon the oil, and upon that which the ground bringeth forth, and upon men, and upon cattle, and upon all the labor of the hands. Then Zerubbabel, son of Shealtiel, and Joshua, the son of Josedek, the high priest, with all the remnant of the people, obeyed the voice of the Lord their God. And the words of Haggai the prophet, as the Lord their God had sent him, and the people did fear before the Lord. Then spake Haggai, the Lord's messenger, in the Lord's message unto the people, saying, I am with you, saith the Lord. And the Lord stirred up the spirit of Zerubbabel, the son of Shealtiel, governor of Judah, and the spirit of Joshua, the son of Josedek, the high priest, and the spirit of all the remnant of the people. And they came and did the work in the house of the Lord of hosts, their God, in the four and twentieth day of the sixth month, in the second year of Darius the king. Notice there with me in verse 14, it says, The Lord stirred up the spirit. The Lord stirred up the spirit. And maybe this morning as we gather once again,
in this room to worship the Lord, God willing, in spirit and in truth. As we gather together, we would give a testimony for those of us that were able to attend this past week and the meetings that we had planned for years. I, I remind you, that meeting that took place this last week didn't just happen. The plan one week and happen the next. We scheduled the meeting back in 2017. We reconfirmed the meeting back in 2019. We put it on a calendar over a year ago and handed it out to our church and said, this, this, this is coming. <laughs> this is coming. Let's make some preparation for it. We took time in our meetings uh, to talk about this, this upcoming meeting and to pray for this meeting and to preach uh, in that direction and to try to get the sense of God and the spirit of God moving in our midst before our revivalists ever showed up to this place. But as we leave from that this morning, by the way, I believe God is just as much in preparation as he is in the performing of something. Excuse me. I don't like the word performing, but God is every bit as much in the preparation for something as he is in it. If you're a Sunday school teacher, if you are a master club worker, if you are a Bible study leader, if I'm a choir director, if I'm a nursery worker, whatever I am in this church, or work in the sound or the ushering, you name it. You name a spot. God is just as much as important in the preparation for those areas of service as he is in the doing of them. And if you're not preparing for that, God help you. You're not fulfilling all that God's given you to do. And that was all for free right there. I thought I'd get, get in a lick right there because we've got to get ready for the Lord's day. And we've got to get ready to serve God. Ready. You know, I've, I've, I've experienced some people throughout the years that just don't like to prepare. They want to open their mouth and hope the Lord fills it. Well, good luck with that. Excuse me. And you might as well say luck because God can't bless it. Be prepared. By the way, the people that you're working with deserve your preparation. I need to do a better job preparing to preach, and I'm working at it. But God is in that preparation. And we, we move away from a meeting that we've prepared for years for and have high hopes and expectations for. And we stand here on the, this morning on the back side of it, and we might be able to say uh, with Haggai under the direction of the Holy Spirit that the Lord stirred up our spirit. Amen. I can give testimony of that this morning. The Lord stirred my spirit in the meetings. The Lord showed me places in my life, areas of my life that I, where I needed to repent, where I needed to consider my ways. And I, when I repented, that means I was walking in one direction, and I changed my mind to agree with God about that thing, and I've turned around and gone in a different direction about it. That's what confession and repentance is. It's agreeing with God. I confess, I agree with him, I repent, and I turn. It's not enough just to be a rocky soil. God help us. We could be rocky soil. We've been in Mark 4 for weeks now. We could be that, that rocky soil when the seed is sown that just gets excited about something that took place. We heard something. We saw something that we liked. And then the sun comes up. It gets a little hot. It gets a little difficult. And it dies. That's not what we want. We want God to stir us up. And we want to see a change in our life. We want to see a change. And if there's no change of behavior, I say again, there's been no revival. If we're not different, then nothing's happened. Haggai here preaches a short sermon, and God touches it and blesses it in a big way. And, and he, he talks, to them, talks to the children of Israel specifically about what God's given them to do. And it's all connected to them returning to God and accomplishing what God gave them to do specifically. As we look at this little book here, as maybe there's not a much to it, but it does pack a punch. It really does in these two chapters. Critics may look at this book of the Bible who, who really don't value the infallibility and the inspiration of the Bible. They, they may just evaluate this as a piece of poetry. And, and they, they are not typically, if you read, read that, read folks in that, in that vein, they're not typically too impressed with this little book of the Bible. Not very impressed with the, the words that are used or the spirit of it necessarily from a human standpoint. But I want you to know it's not the job of the preacher to be a poet. <laughs> It's not the job of a preacher to simply wax eloquent. Now, again, God helped me to prepare, help our preachers to prepare. Thank God we had quite a preacher with us this past week. God bless Brother Ron DeGuard. Amen. The preachers don't speak poetically necessarily. We, God willing, speak at God's direction. And just like Haggai set before the people what God has put in our heart to say according to his word, those issues often deal with faults and failures. They often deal with duties that are being, being ignored and neglected. And, 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 and Haggai does this really in a vivid language here. We heard some preaching like that this past week. And Haggai, in the same way, would stand before God's people and vividly point out their negligence and point out its consequences as they failed to build God's house, the work that God had given them to do, to rebuild the temple. And it's been set aside for a while. 
And he stood up and, 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 and let them know about that. Look here, he says, tells them in verse 4 of Haggai chapter 1, is it time for you, O ye, to dwell in your sealed houses and this house lie to waste? He says, is it time for you to have a completed home, a perfected home, a comfortable home, and the home, the house that we built to worship God lays in ruins, it lays in waste. It's not completed, it's not finished. That's why God sent you back. God didn't send you back, he's saying, to build your house. God sent you back to build his but it's not finished. He says that in verse 4. Look, and, and, and very abruptly as well in, in verse 9, he says, You looked for much, and lo, it came to little, and when you brought it home, I did blow upon it. Why, saith the Lord of hosts? Because of mine house that is waste, and you run every man unto his own house. He's a preacher. He's not a poet. God help us to preach in the spirit of the Lord Jesus Christ, but to preach boldly the truth of the Bible and the truth of the Lord Jesus Christ. And I don't think it depends on our volume. It doesn't depend on our passion necessarily. But if we believe it, I believe there will be passion. But if it's what God says and it's God's truth, God will make it effective in our hearts. God will, will bring the effect that he desires. Haggai preaches a short sermon, and it was a very short sermon. It was, it was much shorter than you typically get on a Sunday morning for me. I want you to know that. Don't be jealous. But it was. It is. But it was effective. It's remarkable that the governor and the high priest and all of the people repented before God and they united themselves together to do what God had given them to do. My friend, that is revival. That is revival. Someone said when the authority of God is acknowledged, his words will be carefully obeyed. When the authority of God is acknowledged, his words will be carefully obeyed. I want you to notice with me, number one, as we consider the rebellion of God's people. We've already uh, dealt with it here in the, in, by way of introduction with this book of Haggai. It's the second shortest book in the Old Testament. has a strong message, and it basically is telling us to put first things first in our life. To put first things first in our life. The reason you and I draw a breath of air, the reason you and I go on after our salvation is because God has a work for us to do. He has a way for us. We're not to chart our own path. We are to yield to the path that God has given us. And thank God Psalm 37, 4 is in the book. If we'll delight ourselves in the Lord, he will give us the desires of our heart. Meaning the things that God's given us to do won't be a burden. They'll be a delight as we agree with the Lord and we're in tune with God. Thank God for that. But here, Haggai is written to a people who would have told you the right things about God. They would say the same things that we would say that God should be first in your life. They would believe that. You and I may believe that, but just like you and I, they had done what you and I have done at times in life. We, they drifted away into a life where they intellectually believed that God was supreme and that God was in authority, but the way they lived did not reflect it. And that's when we come to a point where we come face to face with the truth of God's word. And I believe that's what we sensed this past week as we came together from beginning last Sunday morning at 945 in the Sunday school and going all the way through last Wednesday evening as our friends delivered God's word and preached God's word and sang God's word. Uh, listen, they, they, uh, they brought us face to face with some truths that made us evaluate ourselves and our position before God. And many of us may have been like God's children here that Haggai was addressing. We may find ourselves giving lip service to the priority of God, but in fact living according to other priorities. I don't know about you, but I got under conviction about that myself. It's an interesting line to walk in this life. We have responsibilities. I've, I've, given, I've spoken to you about this before. I, I'm glad to say that I'm someone's husband. I'm glad to say I'm someone's father. I'm glad to say because of that I have responsibilities to provide and to plan and prepare for their lives and to take care of those good works that God's given me to do. But one thing is needful, and that's to be at the feet of the Savior. I cannot do the work of a father or a husband or a pastor if I will not yield at the feet of the Savior. One thing, my friend, is needful. One thing. There are many things we may be cumbered about with as we think of the story of Mary and Martha and God's word. But one thing is needful. That is my place before my Lord, worshiping and serving him and letting him guide and direct my life. One thing is needful. I, I, I learned that again this week. You say, you never heard that before, preacher? Oh, I've heard it a lot of times, but this old hard-headed, hard-hearted Christian needs to hear it often. And I've got a sneaking suspicion you do too. I've got a sneaking suspicion you do too. Yeah, 
There was a rebellion. And it, make no mistake about it, when you and I fall short of the will of God in our life, we are in abject rebellion against an almighty, all-powerful, all-knowing God. May I add to that list, all-loving God. Isn't an interesting thing when someone rebels against someone who loves them dearly? How, excuse me, excuse me, how low and how selfish must you be, must I be, to rebel against someone who loves me so wonderfully? To acknowledge love, to acknowledge the gift of salvation, to acknowledge all this tender, loving care from the Almighty One. How, how, how low and how selfish must I be to acknowledge that and to live in the benefit of it on a daily basis and a moment-by-moment -moment basis and yet chart my own course in this life. My friend, when you understand it that way, that way for what it truly is, no doubt it is rebellion. Can't fall short of anything but rebellion. There's no, no less than what Adam and Eve did in the Garden of Eden as they just shook a fist in the face of God, so, so to speak. They shook their fist in God's face and said, I'll eat anything I want to eat. <laughs> Maybe it didn't seem to be that direct as Eve was deceived and Adam made a direct choice, but I want you to know it's the same impact. It's rebellion. All sin is against God. All sin is against God. And these people were in a place of rebellion. They'd been, they'd been brought into captivity. The Babylonians had come, 586, even before that. The Assyrians had come to the northern kingdom, 722. God's people had been, been taken into captivity because of their rebellion. God's people had been scattered abroad because of their rebellion. But according to God's word, these people had begun to go back to the land. They went back to rebuild the wall. Our friend Nehemiah had that responsibility. And to rebuild God's house, Ezra and his friends had that responsibility. And there was a failure. There were people back, over 40,000 people called back, and they were not doing what God had given them to do. But if you said, do you love God? Oh, yes. You say, do you go to church? Yes. They said, do you know this about the Lord? Oh, yes. Do you believe there's a God? Oh, yes. But they weren't, believe, they weren't obeying God. It doesn't matter. It, it means nothing to know God if you don't obey him. What does it mean to know God if we don't obey him? That's where you and I have lived. Maybe that's what we walked into this past Sunday before we came into God's house. And as, as much as we knew, we were trying to do what we could. But God unveiled some things and, and lifted the scales from our eyes. And maybe by his spirit, we realized that we weren't what we ought to be for God. And that's, thank God, that's where revival comes. That guy stands up. He preaches the truth of God's word. And thank God, the people of God received it. I'm glad to say, as far as I can tell in our church, for those of us that were able to be here and took the time to be here, thank God, I, I'm, I, I am so glad to be the pastor of a church that receives God's word, receives it. I mean, when a man stands up and preaches for an hour and tells you everything that's wrong, and we're saying, Lord, keep speaking in my heart, I'm saying, thank you, Lord, I want to be, be a part of a church like that. If we want to come around here and pat each other on the back, there's some places I can point you to down the road that will help you with that. But we need to be right with God doesn't mean we need to have a negative spirit. But you and I are trying, to, are trying to be right with God, and that requires challenge. That requires the truth of God's word. I want you to notice, number one, the rebellion of God's people, but I want you to notice, number two, the revival of God's people. God sent this prophet to help his people get their priorities in line with what they already knew they should be. It's not, a, it's not an issue. It's not a question of knowing. It's always a question of doing, isn't it? I mean, some of you have been around here for, forever and a day. Some of you grew up in a Christian home. Not everybody had that privilege. But a lot of you have been around God and God's work enough to know what's right and what's wrong and to know what God has for you. In fact, you know what God has for you more than I do, right? I, I have no idea what God's put in your heart. Neither should I necessarily, unless you want to share it with me. If you want to ask the pastor what you're supposed to do, you've made a, you've made a wrong turn somewhere. Get on your knees and look to heaven. I'll be glad to help you now. Don't get me wrong. I can look at you and see your gifts and talents and see where your heart's at. I was just talking about someone recently, and I, I, could see, I said, I can see in your life a gift in this area. That's what I observe, but I, that's up to the Lord what he wants to do with you. But this is what I observe. You won't get my opinion about it, but don't, if it don't go well, don't blame it on me. Go to the Lord, right? Go to the Lord. I'm not here to tell you what to do. If that's what you want out of a preacher, you need the Lord. 
You need the Lord now. I ought to be faithful. But listen, the prophet does stand between the people and God in one sense to get the sense of God's word and declare God's word. And it means nothing without the power of the Holy Spirit. And when God's spirit is involved, what can, ha- what can happen is what happened here in the book of Haggai. What I believe has happened in a deep way in our church this week. God's people can be aroused, stirred uh, to consider their ways and thank God. And, and, and on top of that, to consider the fact and be comforted by the fact that the Lord is with us. I love that, that, that being mentioned in this passage. God's people are revived. The, the result is a mighty revival. They turn from their rebellion, and God enabled them to shake off that sluggishness, that spiritual sluggishness that they, they were dealing with, and shake off that fear of men that they may have been uh, cloaked with. And he inspired them to be zealous and to resolve to enter in it the work that God had given them to do. And my, my God, may, may, may God help us today to be zealous and resolved to do what God's given us to do. If you can take it or leave it, you done left it. Excuse my grammar. If you can take it or leave it, you done left it. God help us not to take it or leave it. If God's putting in something in your life to do, grab a hold of it with God's help and by God's grace, do it for God's glory. Listen, you and I could be in heaven tonight. We don't know what we're promised. And thank God he gives us wake-up calls every once in a while. I love Brother Al Lomberger. He loves, he loves the Lord. In fact, Al is, is not unusual. Al would drop by here a couple times a week, and me and him just sit in the office and rejoice in the goodness of God and, and pick on one another for a few minutes. That's always, that's, I love that ministry that he has, and we just have a good time. But I tell you what, I believe Al loves the Lord. He knows the Lord. I'm not trying to say anything out of the way, but I tell you what, you start having some back pain and some shoulder pain and some chest pain, you have to call the ambulance. That's a wake-up call, isn't it? He and I sat together for a few minutes last night. I had to sneak in after visiting hours. I couldn't get over there before. And I somehow I worked my way into the hospital. It was persuasive there. Don't ask me how I did all that. I'll have to tell you some other time. But as we sat there together and rejoiced and continued to do the same thing we do down in the office. Caleb hears us cutting up every once in a while down there. But both of us realized that we're not promised tomorrow. We don't know what we're promised. It's time to serve God today. I don't want to stand before the Lord and say, Lord, I had every intention of getting to that. I had every intention of following through on that prayer I prayed in that altar or, or in that seat. I had every intention of honoring the calling that you put on my life. I just wasn't ready yet. You know what? You weren't ready. You were in rebellion. And thank God we can have a revival. When we have revival, we, our behavior will be that of obedience, and we will do what God's given us to do. God can do that. He enabled them to shake off spiritual sluggishness and to be zealous and be resolved, and only the Lord could accomplish that. It's a pretty amazing thing that specifically Zerubbabel and Josedek were moved along so much here, uh, moved along so much to get the work done. Joshua, the son of Josedek, I should say. These political and religious leaders were stirred up. Thank God for that. Hey, listen, don't stop praying for that in America. Don't stop praying for that. We pray for all those that are in authority over us, and I don't want to pray prayers that are rude and, 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 and in that regard, but there's nothing wrong with praying for the salvation of our leaders. Sometimes we pray it in spite. Be careful about that with a spiteful spirit. So we may not like the behavior of some of our authorities. And by the way, sometimes they give us good reason for that. Any, any public authority that's going to advocate for abortion, I can't stand with that person. I can't help that person. I can pray for them, but I cannot stand with them. And I will absolutely oppose them and to the face if I have to. But we can do it in the spirit of Jesus Christ. You understand what I'm talking about. Well, let's pray for the revival in, our, in the highest offices of the land and of our commonwealth, yea, even of our county, for a stirring. And it began with the leadership. Thank God it extended to the people. There was a remnant of people, about 43,000 Jews that were back. Their job was to rebuild the temple. They weren't doing it. But God got a hold of Zerubbabel's heart. God got a hold of Joshua's heart. God got a hold of the people's heart. They repented. They confessed. And they did what God had given them to do. They began to obey their behavior lined up with the God that they served. They began to absolutely experience revival. In the midst of it, they knew the Lord was with them, as he said here in the end of verse 13. I am with you, saith the Lord. And the people had heard the preacher preach. They had sensed the reproving of God. But now that tone was beginning to change to one of tenderness. You know, when God changes, when we change, a God who's unchanging changes when we change because when we are turned, when we are, when we have turned our back on God, 
He has to deal with us according to that. But when we turn and face him again, he deals with us according to that. He is unchangeable. He's immutable. The change happens on this side of the coin, amen? <laughs> on my side. And when they turned, now God could deal with them not in reproving but in tenderness. And he would, he would help, instead of chastening them, he would help them to hasten to the call that they had on their life. And God's presence is the best of blessings, one commentator said, for it includes all others. He began a work in their life, and more than anything else, my friend, we need a stirring of God. I believe we had a stirring of God in our midst. We had a beginning, God willing, a new beginning for us. God did it for our friends here, the children of Israel, back in the book of Haggai here near the end of the Old Testament. And God can and will do it for us. I believe he is doing it for us. Their work was the physical act of rebuilding the temple. That's what God had called them to do. We may not be in that, that, that work this morning to rebuild the temple, <laughs> but certainly God has a way for us. God has called us to be a light in this community, and I want you to know rebellion turned to revival, and revival turns to the right reaction to God and his truth. As we've been indicating all the way through at the end of verse 14, at the end here it says, and, and we have here Zerubbabel and Joshua and all of them, the spirit of all the remnant of the people, they came and did the work in the house of the Lord of hosts, their God. The people responded. They united along with their leaders, not with one dissenting voice was not found. They all obeyed the Lord and the words of the prophet. Man, this, this must have been quite a sermon is what we would say. <laughs> Preachers would say, wow, I need to get a hold of that sermon. I want to preach that sermon. Charles Ryrie, the great Bible commentator, commented that seldom has any sermon had such an immediate practical impact. Preachers, preachers are dying for that. Amen. <laughs> we, we, we want to see results, but we have to remember it's God's work. He gives the results, doesn't he? But they had a specific reason and they began to work at a specific time i love being specific i love the idea of being specific you know one of the worst things i think could happen if you want to know my opinion is we move away from this meeting and we say oh god blessed god touched god moved and he did all those things but what did he tell you what specifically i mean specifically if you just felt something, then all we are is rocky soil. If you just felt something good, you felt something stirring, you know what that is? That little, that little weed that shot up in your life is going to die real soon if it ain't dead already. I mean, besides saying it, we were, it, was, it was blessed and we, I, I was, man, challenged. And what did God tell you? You ought to write it down somewhere. In fact, I thought about, I've done it before. I thought about bringing some note cards this morning and passing out and asking you, what did God tell you? I should have done it. Why don't you do it? You could either write it down or better yet, you could tell somebody. We ought to do that because it's that specific. You know what happened in their life? Something specifically happened, the result of their revival. And it says here, in the fourth and 20th day of the sixth month, in the second year of Darius the king, they finally obeyed the Lord. It was recorded. We can find it on the calendar. And I'm through with all this general stuff, excuse me. Warm, fuzzy feelings aren't going to get it done. Warm, fuzzy feelings are meaningless. It's obedience that God is seeking. Don't cry crocodile tears and never do what God's given you to do. Crying is easy. Obedience is hard isn't it? God help me. I'm, I'm preaching to myself this morning, and I know that's where we stand. I'm trying to in, encourage you by God's Spirit. He is the great communicator. By God's Spirit, that you would not forget what God specifically spoke to you about in the meeting. And it ought to be specific. It ought to be something specific, or it was a waste of time. They got back to doing something specific. Uh, Spurgeon, Charles Spurgeon, the great princess pre preacher, said, God takes note of the time when his people work for him. He records in his almanac the day, the month, the year, for he loves to see his people actively engaged in his service. See, these people had revival, and after that encounter, the people were changed. They determined to do what God had given them to do, build the temple. They obeyed God. They were getting in tune with God. And now, tell you what, when we get in tune with God, it will change your life. It will affect our life. And we'll, we'll, we'll leave the complacency behind. We'll leave the lack of concern behind. We will become sincere. We will become productive according to God's economy and God's way. Yes. 
There's no doubt in order to have true revival, we must react to the truth of God's word by yielding. And we must cooperate with his leading. That must be shown in our life. We have to do something. If it's not different, nothing happened. If it's not different, God help me to know nothing happened. I read a story about, uh, about a time management expert. He was speaking to a group of business students. He pulled out a large, wide mouth jar, and he filled it up with fist-sized rocks, big old rocks he put in there first. When he couldn't put any more in, he asked his, the people in the class, is, is this jar full? He asked the question. And the, just about all the class responded, yes. He said, really? Then he pulled out a bucket of gravel and poured it in, shaking it down through the cracks that were left between those rocks. Then he asked, is the jar full? And the students were starting to figure it out now, a little slow, but they're working out. They said, no. He said, good. And he dumped a bucket of sand that filled even more. And, and, and once more he asked, is the jar full? And they said, no. And again, he said, good. And he poured a pitcher of water until the jar was full to the brim. The big rocks and then the gravel and the sand and now the water. And he asked, what's the point of all this? What am I trying to teach you all? And one student said, well, no matter how full your schedule, if you try hard, you can always just fit more in. I'm glad that's not true, <laughs> by the way. Aren't you? <laughs> the speaker said, no, 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 no. The, that's not the point. The point is if you don't put the big rocks in first, you'll never get them in. You'll never get them in at all. The big rocks go in first. What are the big rocks for you and for me? It's God himself. It's God's word. It's God's spirit. And I say to you this morning, it's what God wants you to do with your life. Get the big rocks in first. You and I get our life so full of other things, the big rocks can't fit. And the big rocks are the one we're going to give an account for. We stand before the Lord. So you run around like a chicken with your head cut off. Go ahead. How's that working for you anyway? Because you're giving your time to the gravel and the sand and the water and the big rocks that should go in first. It's about time you and I get empty. Start that thing over. Get the big rocks in. Value what God values. Let him have his way. I believe that's what's been going on in our life. Don't you? You know, that's what God wants us to do. Not emphasize the pebbles and the sand. Let's have the big rocks in. King Jesus should be in there. God's word, God's spirit, God's call, God's work in our life. I want you to know obedience always brings God's blessing. God here, I, I'm not even dealing with it here this morning, but you could see they were toiling and, and just working so hard, but they weren't receiving God's blessings. It was a great fear of mine that you and I will equate some of the material blessings of life with the fact that God is pleased. You know, we get a lot of residual blessings. We live in the most prosperous nation on earth. Most of us are wealthier, wealthier than most other people around the world, and most of that's by accident. Some of us are, are hard workers and have goals and all this. Don't get me wrong, but I'm saying we just being in America has afforded us some residual financial blessings and, and wealth that just if we'd have been born somewhere else, it wouldn't be that way. Period. And don't equate your bank account and what you have and what keeps showing up at your doorstep from Amazon with God's blessing. I don't think that's much of a blessing anyway, if I, especially if I didn't order it, right? But you understand what I'm saying. I don't want to be too lighthearted. God is good. We have a lot of, he, he, there's, there's a general goodness of God that we experience. And the fact that he let us be born in this place is a pretty remarkable blessing. And you and I have got to be careful not to equate the goods of this life with the blessings of God. I mean, look at the Roman emperors. They, they lived, excuse me, they lived high on the hog, as we like to say. But they were, they were killing God's people all along the way. That, that's not the case. You and I have to be careful. God's work uh, depends on the Lord and depends on God to move first. And God's not a puppet master. He simply is drawing us to himself. He wants, he wants you to love him and to serve him because he loves you and he's done all that he can do for you. He wants us to respond to him. He gives the orders. He gives the energy. He, he gives us an opportunity by stirring us up, but we must say yes to him. There, there's something must change in our life. I guess it depends on him. And there's a mysterious uh, symbiosis here where God stirs and we serve.
God stirs and we serve. And I love being stirred up by the Lord. 2 Peter 3 and verse 1 says, I stir up your pure minds by way of remembrance. Oh, don't you remember when you got saved? Do you remember when you trusted Christ as your personal Savior? I hope you know when and where you were. You may not know every detail, the date, the time, the hour, but you remember saying yes to God in salvation. I remember it well as a young boy, as a 10-year-old boy, how God saved my soul, and he saved me from eternal fire and hell. He saved me from damnation, and he saved me from being separated from God in this life and the next. Thank God for it. That's so stirring. Acts chapter 17 and verse 16 Paul was stirred. It says, now while Paul waited for them in Athens, his spirit was stirred in him when he saw the city wholly given to idolatry. God gave Paul an assignment when he got to Athens. He looked around and said, these people need the Lord. And it stirred him up. He was just supposed to wait for a while so some people could come by and pick him up and get him safely to the next place. But while he was there, he couldn't stop preaching. <laughs> he couldn't stop sharing the, excuse me, the gospel. God set him there. God called him there. And you know, I want you to know in the same way, God has given you and I something to do. If you'll turn with me to Exodus 35 this morning as we finish our time together. God has saved you. I trust you know you're saved this morning. You know that your entire eternal life rests in the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. For by grace are you saved. No other way but Jesus. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Whosoever shall call upon the name of our Lord shall be saved. That's salvation, my friend. It's not turning over a new leaf. Are you stirred by the memory of that? I trust you have that memory. If you don't this morning, you ought to get saved in this meeting. This day is what I really believe with all my heart. This is the day of salvation. Now is the appointed time. And then you and I have been in situations in our life. God's called me. He brought me to a little town called Smithfield, Virginia. He put me here. He called me to be the pastor of this church. He's given me a work to do. He's in the same way he has called you and placed you and put you places and given you a work to do. And my, may God help us to honor that Paul looked at what was going on in Athens and his spirit was stirred in him at what needed to be done. Maybe somebody else would walk by and not think much about it, but Paul was stirred and Paul served. Yes. Exodus chapter 35. It's one of my favorite chapters in God's word. It's where... As my dad would say, it's where faith turned into shoe leather. There was some shoe leather put to it. Amen? Some of y'all are trying to figure out what I'm talking about, but y'all just, you need an education. I'm praying for you. Amen. Now, I could read the entire chapter to you. I won't do it for sake of time this morning. But in verse 1, it says, And Moses gathered all the congregation of the children of Israel together and said unto them, These are the words of the Lord uh, which hath uh, commanded you that ye should do them. Six days shall work be done, but on the seventh day there shall be no, uh, there shall be to you in holy day a Sabbath of rest to the Lord. Whosoever doeth work therein shall be put to death. Ye shall kindle no fire throughout your habitations upon the Sabbath day. And Moses spake unto all the congregation of the children of Israel, saying, This is the thing which the Lord commanded, saying, Take ye from among you an offering unto the Lord. Whoever is of a willing heart, let him bring it. An offering of the Lord, gold, silver, and brass. Now this is something specific for them. I'm not, this is not for us this morning. I'm not preaching for a bigger offering, no. I'm not preaching for a building, no. I'm preaching for us to do God's will for us. That's what I'm preaching for by God's grace. And we see a specific example here of God's call here. It's time for them to do some work and to give an offering so that something could be built. The tabernacle here to be built. And, and Haggai, they're trying to get the, 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 the temple rebuilt. That's the work that's going on there. But look what happens here. There, Moses made a plea. I want you to know, everybody, that two and a half, three million people, everybody wasn't on board all the time. It made Moses' job very interesting. Brother DeGard referred to that some the other night. Look in verse 20 if you'll move ahead with me now. So they, they, they said, whoever is of a willing heart, right back in verse 5. Verse 20, it said, And all the congregation of the children of Israel departed from the presence of Moses, and they came, everyone whose heart stirred him up, and everyone whom his spirit made willing, and they brought the Lord's offering to the work of the tabernacle of the congregation and for all his service and for all the holy garments. Moses made a declaration under the command of God. God's people heard him again, and thank God they were stirred by that. God himself had a message for them. By the way, there was a lot of stirring going on. They just experienced Mount Sinai. They just experienced the Ten Commandments. They just experienced a lot of, a lot of things where God got their attention. They ought to be stirred up. 
And Moses stands up and declares the word of God, and they're stirred, and beyond being stirred, they were willing-hearted. They did something. They did what God told them to do. They did what God told them to do. All the congregation, they came, everyone whose heart stirred him up and everyone whom his spirit made willing and they brought the Lord's offering to the work of the tabernacle of the congregation for all the service for the holy garments. You know, my friends, we've had a wonderful week. We're starting a new week. We can't stay back there. We must move forward. We must move beyond for sure just being stirred, just being blessed, just being touched, just being moved. We must move beyond that and decide to do what God told us to do in these meetings. We ought to decide to do it. Don't let it fade. Don't let it fizzle. (laughs) And truly, there does come a time for the shouting and the stirring not only the stirring to stop, but the shouting to stop. The exuberance may, may fade a little bit, but the work must begin. The work must begin. May God help us to do God's will till the Lord comes, or till he takes us home to heaven. Help us to stay stirred up. Help us to know what God wants, and God help us to do it. Their, their spirit was stirred. The only reason our spirit would be stirred is so we could take up a right behavior that God has called us to. Where are you this morning? Are you just stirred up about things? Are you and I willing to say yes and our behavior to change according to what God's given us to do? May God help us to change and do what he's given us to do. Let's pray together. Father, we are grateful that you would even call us into your work. Thank you for calling us in eternal salvation. Thank you for saving us, and I'm glad that anyone who wants to be saved can be saved. I'm glad that Christ tasted death for every person. And I pray that each one here knows that they're saved. They're depending on you alone, dear Jesus, for their salvation. If that's not the case today in this room, I pray people would, in just a few moments, step forward and allow someone to take a Bible and show them how they can be saved. Someone's struggling with the assurance of their salvation because they're so works-oriented. Lord, I pray you'd help them to surrender that today and trust completely to you. I pray you'd work in our midst. Help us to remember what you told us this week, what you worked in our heart about. Help us to know specifically what that is. And, Lord, help us to make the changes that are needed. Lord, I, you won't, I know you won't violate my will. You don't violate our will. You stir us up, but it's up to us to follow through with our decisions by thy grace. Help us to have the courage and to be full of your grace so that we can be what you want us to be. Work in our midst. Help us, God. Help us to change. We pray it all in Jesus' name. Our heads are bowed and our eyes are closed. If you'll stand with me this morning, you'll stand with me this morning. They begin to play a hymn.